Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Dream Big Podcast with Bob Goff and Friends. I'm your co-host, Scott Schimmel. I'm here with Big surprise, Bob Goff. Hey, everyone. I hope it's been a great week for you. And I've been looking forward to you guys hearing from my friend Shannon Sedgwick Davis. Uh, She's not only uh, got a new book out, uh, but she's been this person that's been very influential in my life. And I thought she would be the perfect person to talk about this idea of sustaining belief. We met in India, I bet it was 20 years ago. And uh, uh, seeing what she was doing... uh, informed me about what she actually believed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a a key thing for us to keep in mind in this idea of of, uh, pursuing your ambitions and looking for opportunities and and taking action on those. People will know what you believe when they see what you do. And I am crystal clear on what Shannon believes because I saw what she was doing. Mm -hmm. There's something about having friends around you as you pursue big dreams There's nothing else that's more encouraging to me, nothing else that helps me really sustain the path, sustain believing, besides kind words, encouraging words from close friends. So I love listening to the conversations you have with your friends because I get to see the kind of impact they have on you. Yeah. And so so as you're listening, you might think about a couple people that have helped you sustain belief along the way and grateful mm-hmm. hearts, uh, hearts that express to one another the, the gratitude that you have for what they've done in your life. I hope but what you'll do is find a way to connect with somebody and help mm-hmm. them sustain belief in what they're doing. Thank them for what they've done in your life. Shannon's been that kind of person. She'll give me a call. Mm-hmm. I'll see her uh, at different parts of the country. And we get to reflect back on how much uh, ground that we've covered together. Mm-hmm. And, and so listen in as we talk to Shannon about how she's moved forward with her life and what she's learned along the way. And if you're someone that's on this path, going after your big dreams, and you have questions like I do, do I have what it takes? Is this the right thing? Can I keep going? You're going to want to listen in on this conversation. Shannon, thanks a ton for joining us. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. This one I've been looking forward to because uh, I want to expose everybody to a longtime friend. We were doing the math to figure out how long ago it was that we met, but we were both in India and you were uh, trying to help people then. And you're d- that has been thematic in your life. And I've just been sitting at your feet for all this time trying to learn from you. Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and how you ended up doing what you're doing now. Yes. Thank you, Bob. Yes. I'm a mom and um, of two amazing and spectacular boys. I live here in Texas. I, um, I've always had a heart for issues of justice and around justice. And that's how we intersected, as you say, in India, probably 15 years ago now. And I, in terms of following that heart, I ended up at law school and became an attorney and then ended up doing um, international trafficking work um, with the International Justice Mission and with some other foundations and have found my way to CEO of the Bridgeway Foundation. And it's a money management mutual funds company that gives away half of its profits to try to stop genocide and mass atrocity on the globe. I'm telling you, one of the things that if you're listening that can sound intimidating And you say like, holy moly, (laughs) how do you pull all of this off? But what I would say, what I've observed in your life is that you just do it one piece at a time. You know why you're doing what you're doing, and it leads you to the next kind of square on the checkerboard. Can you tell for people that are listening, like, what was you? So you got out of college and you said, I really have this strong, like, justice cord in my life. Um, uh, what was the next step? Cause you didn't start out at the CEO of a big foundation that, uh, is doing things worldwide. What was the first thing you started doing? You know, the first thing I started doing was just li- listening to that, that beat in my heart, um, and, and paying attention to things that gave me joy and also things that, um, had a disconnect with that joy and started to explore options in international justice work. Uh, spent some time in Turkey during law school uh, that helped refine that for me and helped refine it on more of an international stage for me. 
and then really spent some time in my early career just continuing to say yes to the thing that made my heart beat fast and continuing to engage in those issues. And it really involves listening and listening deeply and uh, trying to really uh, pinpoint uh, what it is that I was created in all the world to do. Yeah, one of the things that I like about you, uh, among a thousand, is that you're uh, very ambitious, uh, but you've uh, not let that uh, ambition turn. Sometimes they, it turns mean uh, that other people don't get it because you do get it, and you're obviously very high functioning. But I've never felt uh, small, or if I wasn't. Uh, up to speed on the justice issues that you were talking about and thinking about, I could join you and you never made me feel small because I didn't know as much as you, you made me feel included. And um, I think that's why one of the important things for people that are pursuing their dreams to find other people that are out in front of you that are living them and then just get in their zip code. I had to go to India to get in Shannon's zip code, but best trip ever because I just came uh, to learn um, how was it, what would you encourage people if they have right now, they're listening, they hear of injustices, uh, what would be a next step? I know what yours were, go to law school, and that is not lost on me, that it wasn't just to think about it or sign a petition, but to actually get equipped to do these things. What encouragement would you give to people as they're thinking about an ambition of theirs? Yeah, I'd say look around. I'd say there's, there's likely many others that are engaged on some of the same issues and around some of the same ambitions that you might have and do precisely what you suggested, Bob. Surround yourself with a community of people smarter than you, um, a community of people who can help you really refine your dreams and your hopes, and a community of people that you can trust and that you can lean on. Because often when we go to the places of our deepest passions, we often will find strife, we will find challenges, we will find roadblocks. And without a community, um, it's often difficult to see the joy. And um, we have, joy is a sustaining oxygen, I believe, for us in any work that we do. And community is where that can be found. One of the, uh, one of the things that's coming to mind right now is this moment entering into the Democratic Republic of Congo and we're going to get in a car to go to a place in a jungle that I don't know anything about. And you started explaining to me as we're passing through the border about the person that we're going to go see and how he'd been shot multiple times <laughs> in the jungle. And one of the things about you, you're just fearless. And you actually give the information to the people around you like me in increments. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in one dose. Like, like, so how many times was he shot? And when was that? And so one of the things that I would say, there's a tenacity and, and a fearlessness that has been a uh, part of your DNA. And certainly that's been helpful. What would you say to a person that doesn't feel uh, fearless? Yeah. And I, I would say that often um, I absolutely do feel fear around some of this work, especially in the early days, right? Just engaging something that is so tr true to your soul is going to bring about this overwhelming uh, feeling of, of fear to some degree, because it is, it's almost so sacred that going there, um, that that sacredness almost beckons um, some hesitation and some fear. And my heart for them would be that again, that they lean on others and that they ultimately jump off the cliff. And it's so funny that you bring up the story in, in DRC and how I gave you um, small information in increments. Uh, I remember a time that you and I were in Canada and uh, you know that I have a healthy fear of water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were we were swimming in the water and like that was already sort of engaging my healthy fear just swimming and you pointed up while we were swimming in the water you pointed up at a cliff and you said hey come come jump off this cliff with me yes i will hold your hand you said i will hold your hand and i think i looked at you and said 
well, no way, um, which is every ounce of what I was feeling. And, um, and you held my hand. You held my hand the entire walk up to the cliff. And we jumped off that cliff together with you holding my hand. And that's probably the best analogy that I have for this. Yeah, I would say some people, I remember doing that, you know, it struck me as like, you could walk into like a rebel group, and they all have machine guns, you're like, whatever. Uh, but it could be these fears that you have that are keeping you if you're listening, from some of your ambitions, and to just be around people that will hold your hand to say, I'm actually with you. If faith is a big deal for you. Uh, that is the thing that uh, struck me about what Jesus was talking to people. He said, Emmanuel, like God with us, he's with us. Just take that next big step. Well, your next big step among many uh, was to end up in Uganda. And for those uh, that uh, haven't read To Stop a Warlord, an incredible book where you've detailed uh, your adventure in Uganda, your ambition about justice. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So as I said, I was running a foundation who had an audacious mission statement. Um, the mission statement was a world without genocide and a world without mass atrocity. And we were sort of covering the globe and the various mass atrocities with grants that either went towards advocacy efforts and efforts to try and actually uh, stop a mass atrocity before it might happen or convince international bodies to intervene on a mass atrocity, or we were picking up pieces on the back end. A uh, school would be burned down and we'd fund the rebuilding of that school. And in 2008, there was a horrific uh, massacre that was occurred at the hands of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA. And that was one of the areas that we had been funding around. And hundreds of people were wiped off the face of the earth while going to their Christmas prayers. And then um, it really caused us to sort of take attention and really look at our mission statement. And then in 2009, we had heard rumors that there would be a subsequent Christmas massacre. And 2009 Christmas came and went and uh, there was no massacre reported. And three months later, I was in Democratic Republic of Congo and meeting with one of the researchers uh, whose work we supported from Human Rights Watch and sitting on the veranda with her having a meeting at which point she hit me with the news that she had just come back from the northern part of the region and had realized that there indeed had been a subsequent Christmas massacre in which 321 people were killed and hundreds abducted. And that was it. Um, our mission statement was not fitting. Uh, we were not doing what we said or claimed to do in trying to help create a world without mass atrocity. And so we had to take a hard look at ourselves and ask ourselves the tough question, are we going to do what our mission statement says, or at least attempt to, or are we going to change our mission statement? And the book chronicles the journey of our decision to try and stop a mass atrocity, to try and do and be true to what we said we were there to do in the first place. And for those that aren't familiar with uh, Uganda and the insurgency that happened uh, for you know almost three decades, can you give uh, just a short primer, the backdrop uh, with uh, LRA and Kony and the others? Yes, absolutely. This has um, long been coined uh, Africa's longest running war. Uh, mm -hmm. Joseph Kony was the founder of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, which began in northern Uganda and ultimately led to thousands of deaths and displacements. Um, eventually, the Ugandan People's Defense Force, the Ugandan military, pushed him out of Uganda, uh, but then he found his way into three neighboring countries uh, with this particular rebel army. This army, um, you know, you hear these numbers of people who have died or been affected by it, and sometimes they can just come across as numbers. Um, I should tell you, in the book, we weave in the story of one person who was affected by the LRA throughout the book, and uh, you get to see the LRA from his lens, a man named David Ochidi, who was actually born in the year that the LRA was started. He lived in a small village in northern Uganda named Pabo. He was abducted by the LRA at 16, and at the point of abduction, they took 
his brothers and also abducted them. And then they forced him by gunpoint to answer, who do you love the most, your mother or your father? And he, of course, said, I, I can't answer that question. I love them the same. And they forced him to say who he loved the most. He answered his father, and they killed his father. Um, he went into the LRA and escaped after six months in captivity. He still has never seen his brothers again. He's been reunited with his family. And he did this incredibly courageous thing that is documented in the book. Um, after he escaped, he made it his life's mission uh, to end the LRA and to help get back home all of those who were kidnapped by the LRA. And he is still doing that work today. So beautiful. I know that the, uh, the sounds, anytime you talk about a, a mass casualty event or uh, a war with so many people affected by it, it's sad. And for some people, uh, particularly in the Enneagram, like a seven like me, it could make you want to kind of pump the brakes. It's just like too much for you. But somehow you've sustained your belief. You said, actually, I want to get more involved. That is a call to action. It's revising uh, and re-upping uh, what we set out is our, our mission and then taking the next steps. The next thing I heard about you, I, I've uh, met a friend of yours. I was in Kampala, Uganda, and he said he'd just come in from three weeks or three months or something in the bush and your helicopter... <laughs> <laughs> that you're using to drop pamphlets. Can you tell us about that? I'm like, Shannon, the helicopter, like what? <laughs> what are we, what in the world are you up to now? Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, that's been the beautiful part of this mission. And you're right, it, it's sad. And I think oftentimes when we hear these sad and sort of devastating places that humanity can go, we oftentimes get bolted to our, our chairs in despair, right? Yes. What we find if we engage these hard issues and if we engage them with our heart and, and, and with the heart that we've been created with, what we actually find is an invitation for deep relationships and relationships that extend to humanity in a way that we that's almost incomprehensible and that brings us deep joy because we're recognizing in doing so that there actually should not be a fence around the human heart that actually our heart is at its best and most efficient way uh, when we don't allow there to be a fence about that around it and what we found and, and the example that you highlight is, is one of the ways where I've seen that come into reality. So as I've stated, the LRA, one of their, their sort of big modus operandi, if you will, was kidnapping younger children, ingratiating them into the army, and then they ultimately become these, these fighters on behalf of this rebel group. And when this happens, you'll often find now that we're 20, you know, almost 30 years into the conflict, you'll find that as you, um, as you engage in this work, uh, there's multiples of the LRA sort of scattered across this vast jungle, 90,000 square kilometers. And it's largely triple canopy jungle. I mean, difficult from above um, in the helicopters to sort of see down to the ground in a lot of places. Um, and that these different units might be hiding. And what you might find is that there is rumor that there's a certain group hiding in a certain spot and that that group is led by someone who was perhaps kidnapped at the age of six or the age of nine from a school in Uganda and now is 26, 29, and is operating to lead these groups. And uh, what we did was we looked at ways to really message to the individual. Again, right, this is a... As a shared humanity, um, we are we are brothers and sisters in this on, and across this globe, and we are all one. We're all one family, and so uh, we would identify who we thought was hiding in a certain region. Uh, David Ochidi, who I've mentioned, and others would trace the families, would look to see if there were any surviving family members, and oftentimes there were. Um, be it a mother or an aunt or a sister or a brother. And David would take his iPhone and record messages from those family members. Dwag oh. um, 
is one of these powerful uh, statements that would be made on these recordings at times. Come home, my son. I have never stopped waiting for you. And then Beautiful. we would plug in the iPhone into our helicopter speakers. We had these massive speakers, think like rock shows. Speakers. <laughs> and then we would hover over these regions where we believed that these individuals might be hiding and they would come out. Uh, 730 came out over the period of the mission. Uh, and it was incredible because the Ugandan government demonstrated such grace. They understood how we had gotten to this position and they knew uh, that they needed to offer grace and did so by creating a law, an amnesty law, that allowed those who were fighting um, to walk out. And if they surrendered, uh, they could be sort of peace of, peaceably like reintegrated into their communities and actually be able to find, um, find meaningful engagement within their families and not be prosecuted. Yeah, each one of these uh, stories just is, you know, uh, an hour discussion in itself. I'm thinking about the power of forgiveness and acceptance and uh, and grace in people's lives. Um, and, and I just am just super practical for how we apply this in our own lives. If you may not, if you're listening, engage a conflict on another continent, but you might say, is there a way to send that message like right here to some either family members or friends of yours that are in a dispute that you don't need to have a helicopter with rock speakers, although that would be awesome. I can't lie. It just... <laughs> But to uh, these messages that we can release. And one of the things that's always struck me uh, in our friendship is that you could be at a soccer game uh, in Texas and then at the same time be sending in like tactical orders in Uganda. <laughs> I just like, so I think for some people that feels like whiplash, but uh, find your thing, find your next step, whatever it is that you're able to do. Don't rule yourself out because you say, well, yeah, it's easy for you if, 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 if. No, actually, your life has not been easy, Shannon, because I've been tracking with it for a decade and a half. It wasn't easy to go to law school and it wasn't cheap either. And you weren't born the CEO of some outfit. You said, what I'm going to do is the next thing. I've got a beautiful ambition. I'm going to do whatever it takes along the way. Let me ask you a question. The uh, title of the book, To Stop a Warlord, it's about Joseph Coney. And uh, Joseph Coney has not been uh, captured as yet. Um, I don't think you feel like the mission has failed. I think you feel like you're right on track. Can you describe that? Because if the mission was capture this guy, then, well, it hasn't been completed yet. I think yours is broader than that. Can you explain that to us? Yes, and we certainly had to learn that along the way. Um, because absolutely, we, we actually had an opportunity that you'll read about in the book, a mission in which we believed it was almost a foregone conclusion that we were going to be able to arrest Joseph Coney. Uh, we had him identified. Uh, there was video footage of him. We had exact GPS coordinates. And sort of the biggest, if you will, failure or roadblock we hit over the entire mission was in the early morning hours in which we thought that that arrest was imminent, realizing that he had just escaped um, in the short time before and had left with the majority of people that he was holding um, captive as well. And that was devastating. So not to discount the sort of devastation that comes with roadblocks and, and mourning, but rather um, it actually helped us become smarter and realize that this, it gives too much credit to Joseph Coney to say that this is about him or that he is the key to dismantling this group. And that's what led to a lot of what we just discussed in terms of peppering a region with flyers to try to get people to walk out, playing speaker missions, caring for each and every last one of those people who are involved and try to beckon them out. The year before we started the mission, there were 776 deaths at the hands of the LRA. Uh, the year that we ended our strategic support, there were 12. And last year, there were eight. And so what I would say the big message there is be cautious in how you define success. 
realize that when you get into something, continue to ask questions, get smarter, and also just trust that at its essence, humanity is good. And you will find so many people along the way and so much support along the way, um, especially if you're cautious with how you define things um, to really truly bring home change. Yeah, one of the reasons that you just immediately sprang to mind under this idea of sustaining belief in this framework of ideas is that you don't think uh, in terms of the destination, you think of the direction. This is the direction that we're moving in. We have a beautiful ambition. There'll be a couple setbacks along the way. But if you know why you're doing what you're doing, then that is the biggest and most encouraging r- r- reminder in your life. And for if you're listening, what's your ambition? Like, uh, it, what's the direction that you're going? You can't take all the steps. You can take the next step. What do you, what resources do you have to do that? If you've got a pen and paper, that's an awesome resource. If you need a, a stamp, like go borrow one or, uh, you know, you don't need to do a GoFundMe to, to put some stamps on letters, write to people. If it's within your ability, go meet with the people, whether it's your neighbor across the store or a, a family member across an ocean that you haven't met yet and they actually look a lot different than you. But take those next steps. And then when something doesn't go right, fine. I'm just thinking of you just saying, well, this one, there a tip-off happens. We don't get the bad guy. You just redouble your efforts to say, well, then let's learn from this and say, what's another way we can do that? And I'm just so delighted to hear that uh, that the a number of people that are die, and any number is too large a number, but to see actually the effects uh, of a lot of hard work. Tell us what's next for you. It's I know it's going to be more of the same, but your your book is out. So many people uh, have been reading it and engaged in their own ambitions because it, it reading your book didn't make me want to be like you. It made me actually want to do a lot more things the way Jesus did it. He just cared for the least of uh, the ones that were around him. What's your next adventure? Yes. So I'm in a season right now of deep and profound gratitude. Uh, the idea of of writing a book was never one that um, that I really thought we would ever do. And uh, truthfully, so grateful to you and others in my life who encouraged me to document this journey. And in particularly grateful because going through the exercise of documenting it in one way sort of teaches us and informs our future work, but it has also just informed this spirit and my soul of gratitude, immense gratitude, Mm -hmm. immense gratitude for all the people I met along the way, gratitude to my family, my precious family who uh, stood by and let me do these crazy things. Um, My parents, my husband, my children, Um, tremendous gratitude for all the friends who jumped around in community and helped make this easier along the way. Um, So I am just sort of spending some time in that and taking that in fully and enjoying that. Uh, And then we're looking at what's next. We have extensive relationships in the region. We've already started to do some work on some other issues that are plaguing the region. We, of course, are keeping a a very close eye on the LRA and particular incidents that are happening there. And it's definitely going to be more of the same. Um, And when you do the work of your, your heart, and I think when you lean into what you're you're created and made to do, it, it's very difficult to turn away from that once you've really done that. Yeah. One of the things that um, uh, thinking in terms of directions, not destinations, I just love that you're just sitting in a place of gratitude for a while. It's probably actually really good for your heart having uh, left so much on the field because this is really very sacrificial stuff because I've tracked your schedule. <laughs> it's like, it's like finding a satellite orbiting the earth um, and to have a time to just sit and rest, enjoy these beautiful kids, enjoy your family, um, uh, but to continue to have this thread in your life to say, what's the next thing? What we've been a little bit conditioned to do, and my myself included, is to see our stories as 120-minute movies 
and there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the end resolves something. You know, you rescued the person, you accomplished the goal, you achieved this, yet this is this reel that just keeps going on and on. It's about continuing to intersect people at uh, places of need and staying aware. So I would say for people that are listening, um, make this super relatable to you to just say you have an ambition, you're going to take action, whether it's going to law school or not, to pursue that ambition. Expect that there'll uh, be some setbacks along the way, but then learn from those, sustain belief, stay on it, stay on it, stay on it. That is the story of your life, just knowing why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and my hope is that as we continue to uh, do some life together, Shannon, that you'll include us in uh, as many things as you can. I know you're not going to tell me the full scoop until we're actually already in the jungle. <laughs> oh, I've got, oh, oh, uh, uh, Shannon quote of the day. Let's go see. Let's go see a gorilla. I'm like, well, whatever. I could see one at the San Diego Zoo for, you know, in 15 minutes. He said, it's like a 20 minute walk, round trip. We'll get there. Uh, and then we started walking into the most dangerous. What are there, 80 rebel groups in this Virunga jungle? Over a hundred. Yeah, all the genocideers from Rwanda went in there. We're walking through the jungle for how many hours? Oh, Bob, I mean, gosh, you're right. I, I really thought that that's exactly the story you were going to. We walked. I mean, Bob, we probably walked and, and through this triple can I mean, total, right, between getting there and coming back and through this triple canopy jungle where at times we would have to just almost hurdle um, impasses to sort of get to the next step. Um, um, landing on safari ants and basically having to strip down and get the safari ants off of us as we continued to walk. I mean, I'm surprised you still talk to me, Bob. That was amazing. We, uh, we were walking through the jungle for hours and hours and hours, and then we stood still for a moment, and then I realized I'm actually standing on an anthill and covered. And not me, but everyone. We were all covered in ants, and they bite. They're like, oh, yeah, they're like ants with attitude. They have shark-sized teeth. I mean, it is they, they rip your flesh. Yeah, and then the once you find the gorillas, they say, then you need to be careful or they will grab you and throw you across the jungle. <laughs> See, this is the thing about incremental. And I think that this incremental information, I think, is one way that God will guard our hearts. Uh, I'm still not forgiving you, but there's just something. I was going to say, you shouldn't forgive me. And Bob, I, the people who know you and know that you are the ambassador of joy for so many. And you, uh, joy is something that has to make your heart beat fast because you, you bring it so readily and you practice it so well in your life. You had every right to have a little bit of the dip in your joy because I certainly had a dip in my joy. Normally this walk would only take about six hours total, like two or three hours in, three hours back. And my joy was definitely starting to dip. And in fact, I started playing loud music from my phone to try to continue to give me energy, which of course was probably signaling all the rebel groups as you suggest. Right. Um, but I didn't care at that point. I was like, come get me rebel. I mean, I just was so done, especially if the rebel had a vehicle of some sort. And the joy that you maintained, I mean, there's a picture of you and I, and we're just laying down, taking a rest on this, on this long hike, probably on safari ants, we're laying down and your face is still plastered with a smile. I mean, it's just this impenetrable joy that you bring, um, was, was pretty remarkable to see out there. Well, my joy was uh, that grin behind that was thinking, I'm going to take you to the highest cliff above the deepest pool of water and make you jump off again. <laughs> hey, Shannon, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time uh, talking and God bless you and all the things you're doing, uh, blessings on your family and all the people that sacrificed to free you up uh, to make these things happen. And I think we're all a little bit more emboldened about pursuing our ambitions by hearing how you pursued yours. Thanks, Bob, so much. I'm so grateful for you. All right. Well, Team Goff is sending loads of love to you guys.
Oh, love to you guys too. Thank you. No matter who you are or what your big ambitions are, everyone's going to face challenges in bringing their dreams to reality. You're going to have setbacks for sure. But even deeper than that, your struggle to see your ambitions realize is going to require that you sustain a deep conviction that you're on the right path, doing the right things for the right reasons. This month as a part of the Dream Big podcast and the part that we're focusing on in the framework, Sustaining Belief, we created a designed guided workbook for you to download and work through your own personalized plan to sustaining belief for your dreams. Guided exercises that are going to help you create a deep foundation you're going to need to keep going. It's free and available to you in the show notes to this episode. Also, this fall, we're offering more live workshops, one at Onsite in Nashville again, and one in Atlanta, both of them in October. These are days set aside for you to invest in your big dreams in a community of other like-minded friends who are pursuing their dreams. All of that guided, of course, by Bob Goff. You could sign up for those workshops at dreambigframework.com. Sign up at dreambigframework.com. All right, Bob. Uh, one of the things I took notes on the conversation between you and Shannon, she said, be cautious how you define success. And as somebody that's been pursuing something for a few years now, I've fallen into the trap of looking at the wrong things, I think, to, to let me know that I'm on the right path or not, if I'm being successful. But I loved hearing that, that she's just warning us, be careful, be careful what you look at to define why you should keep going. Yeah, you need to uh, uh, develop your own set of metrics for your dashboard. Like what are yeah. the gauges that are going to give you the most accurate information accurate, yeah. that will be actually helpful to you. Mm -hmm. So if I knew like engine temperature, I don't really care if it's still yeah. going i'm like i'm still <laughs> going um rpms uh, mm. would be important to me but i actually kind of want to know uh, uh wh what kind of a pace what kind of wear and tear is this pace putting on mm. my life and so and more importantly what kind of uh wear and tear is this putting on someone else's life that yeah. i love and so uh, as you gauge what success is, mm -hmm. it'll give you a more accurate view of like, what are the important metrics for me to look at? If your faith is in God, he is totally unimpressed <laughs> with yeah. your successes because right. we keep bringing him uh, successes and he keeps asking for our hearts. And yeah. so yeah. that should be incredibly freeing mm -hmm. for us. You can just like cut loose those things and just start saying, um, I want to replace mm -hmm. some of the... Of things I've had my eye on, like applause mm -hmm. or affirmation or feedback loops or uh, yeah. the things that are kind of the low hanging fruit. I want to replace those with something a little bit higher minded. That could be a great question you have, even for your kind of tribe around you, like to ask them the question what do you think I should consider as success? What should be on that dashboard for me? To ask other people to speak into that, because your wife or your, your spouse, your significant other might say different things than you would. Yeah, so some would say it would be economic success, yeah. and you'd say, and that certainly is easy to quantify because you mm -hmm. see how much money is either in your bank account or not, or, 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 <laughs> not or whatever, but that can be kind of mm -hmm. a, a, a big uh, false positive yes. uh, because you end up uh, uh, getting some economic success, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah. then you could say some relational success. You could like want awesome relationships. And so to uh, have that, uh, they just don't come with gauges. Mm, yeah. You don't get like, you know, uh, a one to 10 uh, from people on your relationships. Uh, but you can say, I actually going to gauge it by how many meaningful conversations I'm having each day. Mm. Now, that would be something that would be yep. actually helpful. You're not talking about the weather or a sports mm -hmm. team or something. Talk about, I want to uh, do a little bit of self-disclosure mm. each day. I want to disclose to somebody how I'm feeling. I'm feeling actually kind of insecure right now. Mm -hmm. I came back from a uh, time away and was able to get our staff here together to say, actually, I'm feeling really lonely. I'm mm. not sure why that is, but I just feel really lonely. It's actually a beautiful thing mm. that um, to say, uh, 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 get real with yeah. people around you about why you're doing. They know I'm not going to camp out there, yep. but for that moment, that's how I was feeling. And uh, to let people know that might be mm. a really meaningful metric mm -hmm. on your uh, dashboard. Absolutely. She also said in your passions, you're going to find strife. And that just, I just wrote that down, underlined it, bolded it. It's so helpful to hear somebody that I look up to as successful and making a big dent in this world. And she's like, yeah, it's going to be hard. 
Yeah, and so wipe that surprised look off your yes. face. Yes, every time. <laughs> so like, yeah. wait, what? He yeah. said like, uh, replace that with, of course. Right, yeah, here we are again. Yeah, yeah. yet again. Yeah, yet again, uh, there are some difficulties in front of me, and I'm going to keep my eye fixed on the prize, Come yeah. my eyes fixed on Jesus, I'm going to tackle whatever is in front of me, not with a bunch of bravado, yep. but with a bunch of... Uh, a, a, a reasons like yeah. you know why you're doing it and if you know why you're doing what mm. you're doing now we got a ball game well it, maybe that's part of the dashboard too as we're talking about this you're the strife the conflict the pushback maybe that's a sign you're on the right path maybe that's actually an indicator yeah you're you're doing what you should be doing yeah i want a resolve meter uh, yeah. not that things oh, were great. resolved but how much resolve you bring to this yeah. you go like oh heck Your no tank. Yeah. no we're going to yeah. totally do this yeah. we're uh, uh uh embarking on another uh ambition in another country which actually uh i don't know if they allow what we're going to do <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice way of saying that that's very um, sweet but uh but my resolve meter is pegged they yeah. go like, oh, heck yeah, mm-hmm. we're so doing mm-hmm. this, not even funny. Yeah. Uh, and will it work out? Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, just uh, if your resolve meter is pegged, you know why you're doing what you're doing, and it's a worthwhile, beautiful ambition, yeah. go for it. Maybe you can close this out with just a word of encouragement for people that maybe their resolve meter is a little bit low right now. Yeah, man, welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, first, if if you can identify with that, that means that you're self-aware enough to know that you actually are feeling a little low. You're in touch with how you feel. Talk to somebody, and the game rules are this. You go and you talk to them. It can be a counselor. It can be a friend, but have them not fix you. Just say, don't fix this for me. I just need to disclose to you how I'm feeling. And uh, do the other thing. Don't just get stuck in how you're feeling. Talk about what's your ambition? What is your purpose? And 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 uh, think through what are the ways that you could build greater resolve to uh, continue on with these beautiful purposes that you have. And so as you're talking these things through, you're going to get clarity. Uh, And that's what we need. If you just have clarity, Mm -hmm. it's like being at the shopping center, having the X on the big map Mm -hmm. and saying you are here. Hmm. As soon as you figure out where you are, now we got a ball game. But if you go like, I don't know, North America, (laughs) (laughs) that's going to be hard to find your way forward. But if you actually say I was uh, uh, coming out of this inlet where we live in Canada and it was like, I think it was one in the morning and (laughs) it was foggy and stormy all that. And sure enough, like there's no radar, there's no GPS, it all went out. So I just followed the shoreline. And I go like, wow, there's a simplicity and a beauty about that. Follow the shoreline. Find the things that you're certain about, Mm. the things that are immovable in your life. Follow the shoreline. So write those things down. Write down what you know to be true, what you believe in, what you know to be true about yourself, and keep going, keep sustaining belief. 